Welcome to Let's Talk. Our session today is titled, Small Moments Make a Big Difference, Implementing and Testing an Innovative Video Coaching Program in Washington State. I'm Debbie Mathias from the BUILD Initiative and the Director of the QRIS National Learning Network. Before we begin our session, I'd like to thank the Alliance for Early Success and other generous funders for making this learning community possible. We began this series for state quality administrators and leaders to support their essential work within states around early learning systems building. Quality administrators are welcome to invite other participants as related to the specific topic of the call. We know several of you invited colleagues and, in, and interested in QRIS implementation, especially technical assistance coaches, infant toddler coaches, as well as colleagues from Head Start, Pre-K, and Early Intervention. We've, we have colleagues on the call today from over 27 states and territories. I can tell this topic was of interest to many by the number of folks that signed up. We intentionally keep the session small to invite conversation and sharing. We hope these calls enable us to illuminate challenges, innovation, and promising practices. After the session, a survey will pop up asking for your suggestions, comments, or questions. We appreciate your input and ideas about the session, and we'll follow up with resources as requested. Also, thinking ahead, let me know if you are working on a promising practice or facing a challenge in your state system building. Send me an email and we can develop a Let's Talk discussion around the topic. Make sure to keep track of your ideas, questions, and examples for our talks which are, which are interspersed throughout the session today. Or put them in the chat box and we can work on them as we move through the session. The topic today comes under the title of Innovations We're Tracking to Deepen the Skills of Practitioners in the Field Working with Young Children. When I heard about this project, I found it extremely interesting and hoped you would too. Thank you for taking the time to answer the questions when you registered. Many of you provided thoughtful ideas and questions. We reviewed the information and it's informing the presentation. Under the first category, do you have access to data about the quality of interactions in infant-toddler classrooms in your state? And if so, what are you learning? A lot of you mentioned that using the class was giving you strong data to understand interactions in the classroom, especially in infant-toddler classrooms. Um, there were a few comments like this. Infant toddler classrooms actually have better and more intentional teacher-child interactions than some of our preschool classrooms. Much more attention needs to be given to the transitional classrooms between toddlerhood and preschool. Um, we have one uh, participant that noted coaching with the use of specific strategies tools and ideas along with really using the data has improved the teacher efficacy along with increased class scores in a variety of areas. When we asked you what efforts are underway in your state to promote responsive interaction, we heard about the Expanding Quality for Infants and Toddlers initiative in Colorado. And maybe we'll have time to ask a question to you folks about that down the road. Um, we noted that some folks were revising their infant toddler standards in their QRISs and that you were looking to um, use a category assessing responsive interactions. And another state uh, mentioned the infant toddler credential they're working on and that one of the competencies related to responsive interactions. So this is a topic that's of great interest in the field right now. Well. Without further ado, I'd like to move us into the content of our session. We have quite a few panelists today, so we've asked that they introduce themselves as we move through the session rather than all at the beginning. Um, really, 
hearing the variety of perspectives each of these presenters bring to the content is just so interesting. We couldn't eliminate anyone. So we're going to give it a good effort and um, move through our section. So please enter your comments, questions. We will have pause points at the end of each section for you to weigh in and um, share your point of view what's going on in your states, or ask a clarifying question. Well, without further ado, I'd like to move on to Melanie Berry. Um, she's a clinical scientist with the Stress and Neurolo Neurobiology and Prevention Laboratory at the University of Oregon. Melanie, can you say anything else to introduce yourself and launch us into our session today? Sure, happy to. Um, well, hello everybody. As Debbie said, my name is Melanie Berry. Um, I'm a research associate at the University of Oregon and part of the team that has developed FIND, which we'll be talking about today. Um, and before we dive into the presentation, I wanted to take a moment to just give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about. Um, we're going to start with some background on um, our understanding of the need for an innovative approach to promoting responsive interactions in early learning. Um, then we'll provide an overview of the FIND video coaching program. After that, uh, two of my colleagues will describe a particular uh, statewide implementation and evaluation of FIND in Washington State in the context of early learning. and. Um, We'll also discuss the evaluation efforts that are underway to help us understand the impact of that work. And then we'll close with some sort of forward-looking thoughts about uh, what we see as next steps for this work. And uh, going back to what Debbie said about this presentation being given by a panel, when she and I were initially talking about um, hosting a webinar about the FIND program, initially we were thinking just maybe one or two members of our team based in Oregon could give this talk, but we very quickly realized that because this work has truly been a collaboration across a number of partners, there is really no way to tell this story and do it justice if it was just one of us giving our perspective. And so uh, we, we grew into quite a panel. So what you're, who you're going to hear from today will be myself, um, a colleague at the Department of Early Learning, Roxanne Garzon, um, Luke Quinn, who's based at Children's Home Society of Washington, um, a colleague of ours named Victor, who was one of the interventionists involved in implementing the program, two of our colleagues based at the University of Washington, Janet and Natalie, who can give us some perspective on the evaluation work underway, and then my colleague Phil Fisher, um, who will be giving closing thoughts at the end of the presentation. So um, it should be a very rich discussion with a lot of different voices and perspectives, but as I said, I think that's the best way to tell the story. Um, so I'm going to pass the baton now to my colleague Roxanne Garzon um, from the Department of Early Learning, um, and then you'll hear from me again uh, a little later in the presentation. Hello, um, my name is Roxanne Garcon, and I work at the Washington State Department of Early Learning. I am the QRAS Special Projects Lead, and I'm going to give you a brief overview of the need for an approach to promote responsive interactions in early learning settings. So just as a little bit of background, um, Washington's QRIS framework, Early Achievers, promotes high quality early learning across systems serving children birth to five. And Washington has a fairly new QRIS, um, and it supports early learning providers in licensed childcare, Head Start, and state-funded preschool, which we abbreviate as ECAP. Uh, Washington's QRIS began with the Race to the Top Early Learning Grant and is now in the process of uh, making some revisions in our standards, and we're streamlining and aligning our QRIS standards as well as our licensing regulations and our ECAP performance standards as well. Quite a big undertaking, but we're excited about it. Um, pr uh, prior to um, QRIS coming to Washington, there was already a regional model of infant toddler consultants that were providing on-site consultation to child care providers. Um, it was 
supported by our local early learning coalitions, and the work was the first strategy to address the needs of childcare quality for infants and toddlers. These consultants provided on-site visits designed to improve infant and toddler childcare with a primary focus on health promotion. A small number of trained consultants were in the field providing on-site support to a variety of early learning programs independent of QRIS development in Washington. Then with Washington's focus on quality improvement efforts, it was the merging of infant toddler supports with early achievers resources that allowed for a data-driven targeted approach to infant toddler quality environments. By leveraging um, these resources, Washington has been able to target the supports for early learning programs that provide services to families of the youngest children who are the furthest from opportunity, as well as conduct a robust evaluation of the effectiveness of these supports. So the Washington Legislature and the Governor support early learning quality improvement efforts and positive outcomes for children. And um, originally, a voluntary framework, our QRES um, has changed. The Early Start Act, which was signed in 2015, now mandates participation in early achievers for early learning providers that are accessing state subsidy and that early learning providers meet a threshold of quality to maintain their subsidy eligibility. And so all of the early learning programs in this project are providing licensed or certified subsidized care for infants and toddlers. They're either a family child care home or a child care center or an early Head Start program participating in our QRES. And this project is made possible with funding from the Department of Early Learning through the CCDF Infant Toddler Quality Set-Aside Dollars. So the QRES data that we had in the preliminary um, data collection that we were doing indicated that many infant and toddler classrooms were scoring lower, and I know I had seen that in some of the comments to the questions that Debbie had asked earlier, um, that, that the infant toddler classrooms were scoring lower in interaction, uh, freedom of exploration, and language supports, among some other areas. And the data collection for our state right now um, is including the iters R and the toddler class or infant class if the class does not have toddlers and it's just infants. Um, so the focus on uh, the development of an approach to promote development supportive interactions was informed by the data that we collected. Um, and the data allowed us to um, include the existing infant toddler consultation network into the early achievers framework. Within that existing network, DEL was able to look at the development of a unified approach across regions to promote interactions and to improve childcare quality for infants and toddlers in early achievers facilities. With that, I am going to turn the baton back over to Melanie to give you an overview of the FIND program. Thanks, Roxanne. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Roxanne gave us sort of a, a snapshot of the context in Washington State, and I think some of what led to interest in bringing in a, a new approach to targeting responsive interactions and early learning. Um, and what I'm going to do now is tell you a little bit about um, the approach that was implemented, which is called FIND. Um, FIND stands for Filming Interactions to Nurture Development. It's a video coaching for parents and other caregivers of young children, typically between the ages of zero and four. Um, and what we do in FIND is we use video to reinforce and strengthen naturally occurring developmentally supportive interactions between young children and the adults in their lives. Um, and so I want to mention here that the FIND approach was originally developed to serve parents. Um, and we have used it to support you know, moms, dads, other family members, um, foster parents, adoptive parents, and so on. Um, and it was through this partnership with the Department of Early Learning in Washington State that we adapted the program for use in early learning context. Um, and what was really interesting to us is that the core approach did not really require a lot of um, adaptation to be relevant to early learning context, which is really what we were hearing from the folks in Washington State. You know, this work that you're doing with parents to focus on warm, responsive interactions is very relevant in early learning settings, and that was really our experience in making the adaptation. There were um, changes that we needed to make in terms of wording and framing certain, concept, certain concepts, 
in the visuals that are used throughout the program to make them really meaningful and accessible to the early learning providers, and somewhat to the process that we use to employ this video coaching in classroom or home or center-based settings. Um, but it was a pretty straightforward um, adaptation and a good fit into those contexts. So at the core of FIND is this idea of serve and return interaction, with which some of you may be familiar with. This is um, an idea that came out of the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard, and it's a way of talking about the type of interactions that happen between young children and adults that really foster and promote brain development and skill development. Um, it's obviously a metaphor taken from tennis, of all places. Um, and you know, the idea is that in tennis, one player serves when they hit the ball over the net, and the other player returns that serve, um, and that sort of kicks off this game. Um, and if you think about it, it's a lot like that when we interact with babies and young children. They initiate in many different ways by making sounds or saying something, by looking, so looking at something, by doing something or showing a facial expression. And as adults, we can uh, return that serve, if you will, when we respond to them in ways that are developmentally supportive. Um, and this metaphor of serve and return is really at the center of the FIND program. And it's, it's sort of the framework that we use to help um, early learning professionals really reflect on these seemingly small moments that they're having with the children that they care for and why they're so important and how they make such a big difference. We, within the context of FIND, we break serve and return interaction down into five elements. Um, each element is the focus of a specific coaching session, um, and I'll talk through those just briefly. So the first element that we introduce is the idea of sharing the child's focus. Um, so noticing the child's serve and really tuning in and putting your attention there too. Um, so an adult might do this by looking at the child or looking at what the child is doing, by um, leaning in or bending down, sort of physically orienting to the child, and really starting to engage with them around the thing that they're interested in at that moment. Um, so that's our first element, sharing the focus. The second element is what we call supporting and encouraging. And what we're looking at there are all the ways that an adult, having noticed a serve, can respond or return that serve in a way that's developmentally supportive. So for instance, you know, if a young child serves to, sh to show you they're in distress um, by crying, for instance, you might return that serve with support by picking them up and soothing them. Um, a young child on the playground might serve to show you that they're excited about something by holding up a toy to you, and you might return that serve with encouragement by smiling at them and saying, wow. Um, our third element builds on that and brings in a, a moments where you notice a child serve and return that serve by giving them a word or some language for what they're seeing or doing or feeling. Um, and obviously, these moments are really important for language development. Our fourth element is back and forth interaction. And in that session, what we're talking about is the way in which these initial serve and return interactions can spark longer, sustained, reciprocal, back and forth interaction. Um, so going back to the tennis metaphor, this idea that you know, the game doesn't end after the initial serve and return. The real action is in this sort of ongoing back and forth between the players. And it's a lot like that in our interactions with kids. A lot of, a lot of learning um, can take place in the context of those back and forth interactions. The fifth element is what we call endings and beginnings. And mm -hmm. these are moments when a young child um, shows in some way that they're ready for a transition or a change or that they're all done with something. Um, and as an adult, you might notice that um, and sort of follow their lead into the next activity. So they might show you that they're all done with one thing and serve to start something new. And, and here we find that it's really important, of course, to acknowledge that much of the day is sort of necessarily adult-led. 
Um, but that even in the course of sort of a busy day as you're moving from activity to activity, there might be these opportunities to sort of notice a child's cue that they're ready for a transition from one thing to another um, and support them through that transition. And those can be small transitions, like they go from eating one thing to eating another thing, or they go from stacking the blocks to lining the blocks up, or they can be bigger transitions um, from one activity to the next. So those are our five elements that are the focus of our coaching sessions. Um, and the way that we um, coach around those concepts is through video. Um, and what we do is we, um, we engage caregivers in a process where um, they, they begin by being filmed in their natural setting, interacting and caring for children um, for about 10 minutes at a time. Um, the filming is in intended to be as natural as possible so we don't give the caregivers any instructions on what they ought to say or do while they're being filmed. We really encourage them as best as they can um, to try to pretend like we're not there and to just do what they would normally do um, with the kids that they're caring for. That film is then edited using um, an approach called microsocial analysis. So uh, what we're doing there is we watch the film very carefully, moment by moment, looking at the interactions between the children and the adult and looking for these moments of serve and return, particularly around the element that will be coached next. So if you're about to coach for naming, you would be watching that film, looking for clips where the caregiver is naming. Those clips are then um, compiled into a short film that's specially designed to really optimize learning. Um, so these are short clips. We trim out everything except for just that serve and return moment. Um, we, we play those clips three times in a row. The first time it plays all the way through. Um, and what caregivers will say is that uh, it's hard to pick out the serve and return interaction sometimes the very first time you see a clip. Then, the second time the clip is played, the coach starts and stops the film and narrates what they're seeing to draw the caregiver's attention to the important things that are happening, um, to the subtle serve on the part of the child and the way that caregiver noticed and tuned in and then responded in a developmentally supportive way, drawing their attention to how they're engaging in that element of serve and return and really celebrating that kind of in the moment as you're watching the film with the caregiver. So it's a very sort of positive strength-based reinforcing process. Then the clip plays again a third time all the way through and that's intended to give the caregiver an opportunity to sort of consolidate and reflect on what they've learned. Um, so at any particular coaching session, we might play um, three clips that show the caregiver engaging in that element, and we would play each of those clips three times. Um, we repeat this cycle a total of five times, so five filming sessions and five coaching sessions, touching on each of those five elements that we just discussed. Um, typically, we go through that process over the course of ten sessions, alternating between um, filming sessions and coaching sessions, but FIND is really designed to be flexible um, so that it can be sort of adapted and tailored to a particular setting where it's being implemented. Um, it's flexible in the sense that we've offered it individually and in group-based contexts. Um, we've also, we're starting to explore offering it um, online through web conferences or remote implementation. It's flexible in terms of duration. So an average coaching session lasts about um, 20 minutes to a half hour, um, and it can be done alongside other curriculum or other programs. Um, and as I said, we typically implement over the course of 10 sessions, but that can be um, adapted. So in some contexts, we've offered the program over the course of six meetings, where you film and coach at each session. Um, so there's, there's a lot of flexibility around that. Um, and we, we've also implemented the program in both English and Spanish, and we're doing some development work now um, to implement the program in Chinese, which is a recent development. Um, we accomplished this video coaching through a team-based approach that involves three roles. So um, there is the person who is working directly with the early learning provider 
Um, we call that person the coach who's going in and taking the film and sharing information and the clips back with the coach. There's an additional role which we call the editor, and that's the person who's reviewing the raw footage, selecting out these clips, and compiling the film. Um, and then we typically have somebody who's in a consultation role who's providing training and support to the editors and coaches. And importantly, the role of the editor and coach um, can be played by one or two people. In some contexts, the coaching team is trained to do the editing themselves, and that can work really well. Um, but in other situations, such as the implementation of Washington State, the editing and consultation can be provided by a regional hub. So in Washington State, as you'll hear more um, from Luke about in a minute, the regional hub for implementation is a Seattle at Children's Home Society of Washington, and a small team of editors and consultants there is able to support the network of 20 plus coaches that are implementing the program across the state. Um, and we're able to share the video files um, through a secure HIPAA compliant file sharing site that makes that team-based approach really doable. Um, and we set it up that way because we thought it would make the program just more um, feasible and flexible if it was possible to have that sort of um, specific skill set of editing the films be concentrated in a regional hub as opposed to having to build that capacity across everybody who's implementing the program. And that's been working pretty well for us. Um, I want to just pause briefly on our um, program theory of change. So we developed this theory of change using um, an approach that was developed at the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard. Um, using a framework called the Ideas Impact Framework. And um, we, as a team, worked together on this theory of change to really kind of capture our thinking about how this video coaching um, might have an impact on the um, caregivers themselves who are participating in the program and importantly on the children who are in their care. And I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but we felt it was important to share with you because this formed the foundation for the evaluation of the program, um, which the team from University of Washington will share more about. Um, so if you look at the model starting on the left-hand side, um, we note our strategies. So what are the kind of activities that are part of this program? You know, we're providing information to caregivers. We're engaging them in video coaching and sort of focused discussions around those elements. And um, our goal through that is to really target serve and return interaction in the five elements. So we're hoping to see a change over time with caregivers being um, more tuned in and responsive and engaging in those elements. And then um, our thinking is that, that that will lead to a host of positive changes for both the caregiver and the child. Um, and you'll see that one of the things we've called out is caregiver executive functioning, um, which you may be familiar with sort of this idea of the, the set of skills that include things like mental flexibility and controlling impulses um, and sustaining your attention. Um, we think that that capacity on the part of the caregiver actually plays a really key role in these serve and return interactions. The ability to stay tuned in um, and to resist distractions and to inhibit the impulse to sort of take over the interaction or um, you know, sort of get, get busy with something else. It, it's really drawing on this skill set of executive functioning. And so that's why you see that kind of represented in our model. And um, we also have some thoughts about factors that might be associated with people, you know, benefiting more or less from this program. Um, and one of the things that we're really interested in is the extent to which um, the caregiver's own experiences of sort of stress and adversity might impact um, the, the extent to which they benefit. And in some of our previous work with FIND, what we've seen is it's actually folks who themselves have had early experiences of stress and adversity who seem to benefit most. And that's really helpful information for us because it gives us a sense of who we might target this program towards. You know, if we're not able to offer it to everybody, how do we get it into the hands of people who would benefit most? Okay, um, I want to pause to just note um, where we're at in terms of evaluating the impact of FIND. 
Um, and this is a kind of looking at it generally. In a, in a few moments, the team from University of Washington will talk about implementation, excuse me, evaluation within the context of the work in Washington State. But um, in a bigger picture sense, um, the program is currently being implemented and evaluated in a number of settings, including three sort of larger scale randomized trials and multiple smaller scale studies. Um, we're very committed to understanding not only, you know, does this program work sort of on average for the caregivers that we engage with, um, but what can we learn about who it's most helpful for and who benefits less um, so that we could perhaps adapt it or enhance it to be more effective for those folks, as I was talking about just a minute ago. Um, and what I can say is that so far, our preliminary findings have been really promising. Um, we've seen increases in um, the caregiver's sense of competence, decreases in their stress, um, improvements in caregiver-child interaction, and improvements in child behavior. And for the most part, those preliminary findings have been with parents, um, and it's one of the reasons we're really excited to have this opportunity in Washington State to be looking at the impact um, with early learning providers to see if those same findings really hold true in that new context. Um, and we should have results of some larger scale trials, including um, the evaluation of the work in Washington State in 2018. Um, so to kind of sum up um, some of the, we think, kind of key ingredients of FIND um, are that it's genuinely a strength-based approach. So you might have noticed as I was describing the video coaching process that um, the caregivers are filmed and the clips are selected before we've taught them one of the elements or a specific skill. So that allows the coach to go into that session and say, you know, for instance, today we're going to talk about naming and why it's so important to promote cognitive development and language development in kids. And I've got three great clips that show you naming for the kids in your classroom. So at the, at the heart of that process, there's this really important message that lets the caregivers know um, that they are doing this and when they do it, that it's really helpful. Um, a couple of other aspects of the program, um, it targets really clearly defined caregiving skills. And this is a little different from many existing video coaching programs that take a sort of more broad approach um, to analyzing video and, and discussing a really wide range of themes with caregivers. We're really using video in a very targeted way to promote one kind of core skill set um, that is essential for developmentally supportive caregiving. And what we do with the video is to break those skills down into clear, simple steps. Um, what we're really aiming to do is to create a very robust coaching process so that you know, at the end of the program, in four months, in six months, in a year, we're really hoping that these ideas stick with these caregivers and that they're salient um, and really meaningful to them over time as opposed to just being like a flash in the pan. Um, and I've already talked about some of the ways that we've intended for the program to be feasible and scalable. Um, okay, so uh, I think we want to pause here to open it up for yes. questions and comments. Yes, this is Deb. Um, I can see in the chat book box that we have someone saying, find reminds them of Dr. Jun Li's work around simple interactions out of the Fred Rogers Institute. And they were wondering, has his work informed any of your work in developing find? That's a great question. Um, I'm actually going to invite my colleague Phil, who's here in the room with me, to field that one. Hi, everybody. Um, it's, it is a great question. We get asked this question not only about um, Dr. Lee's work, but also about a number of other strategies that are commonly employed that include circles of security, um, attachment and biobehavioral catch-up, um, and other kinds of video coaching approaches. And it's no surprise that there's a lot of um, overlap conceptually, because really what all of these approaches do is to target 
we're, I think what, what I would say is kind of the confluence of um, what a lot of the developmental science has shown is the core process, an elemental process, that supports healthy child development. And that is responsive, contingent um, interaction with the child. Um, the answer specifically is, in terms of Dr. Lee's work, is that it hasn't directly informed our work. In fact, that team got in touch with us and said, hey, we heard about FINE. It sounds a whole lot like our program, mm -hmm. um, and we'd love to, to talk and compare notes. Um, and that's happened a great deal. The, the strongest actual um, sort of roots of influence for FIND is a program that developed originally in the Netherlands called Marte Mayo, which is a Latin term that means of one's own strength, um, which is a video coaching program that's very popular um, in Europe and in a number of other places, but not so much in the U.S. Um, we learned of that approach um, through colleagues that we have in Sweden, and they trained us in that approach. Uh, what our primary adaptation was, was to try to make that program that is sort of more of an expert model and requires a, a long-term kind of consultation supervision process to master um, into something that was more concrete and scalable. Um, but I think it's a great question in terms of the kind of potential conceptual overlap in the programs. And as far as we're concerned, we sort of see them as branches of the developmentally supportive tree. <laughs> That's great. Hey, Debbie, I'm going to suggest if it's okay with you that we move on um, to All right. Victor's content, and maybe we could cover some more questions at the end. That sounds great. Okay. Hi, my name is Luke Quinn. I am a social worker and co-project manager of all of our FIND projects here at the Children's Home Society of Washington, and one of those being the FIND DEL project um, across Washington State. Uh, I started as a FIND coach about five years ago when I was an early Head Start home visitor, um, and then I was trained up as an editor and then as a FIND consultant, which are the roles I've been filling with FIND DEL. And I also want to give Victor a chance to introduce himself. Victor? Hello, everyone. My name is Victor Cardenas, and I'm an early learning specialist lead at Catholic Charities Serving Central Washington, working within the Child Care Award Network as an infant public coach. I come from a background in clinical work, uh, working with young children and families, um, and I'm also part of the Washington Association for Infant Mental Health, and I'm currently a certified fine coach providing services, or have provided the fine services throughout uh, about eight to ten counties in Central Washington. And we're going to hear a lot more from Victor in a little bit um, about something I mentioned. Most of you want to hear about is the actual on-the-ground coaching. Um, but first, I'm going to have a couple of slides here just uh, introducing the FIND DEL project specifically. So this was a collaboration, obviously, between the Department of Early Learning here in Washington State. And we already heard from Roxanne about why um, they thought it was important to test FIND in their um, uh, different regions across the state. Um, and they already had infant toddler consultants, infant toddler coaches, um, in 10 different regions across the state of Washington, and we were really lucky to be able to tap into that network um, because they already had you know, knowledgeable early learning professionals in those positions who had existing networks and connections to child care centers and family home child cares. Um, and we trained up those consultants as fine coaches. Um, so we didn't have to sort of start from scratch. We already had this sort of um, system in place. Um, of course, Children's Home Society of Washington, we are the sort of hub of editing and consulting um, for the FIND DEL project, and uh, of course the FIND development team at the University of Oregon, they came up with FIND, and they uh, sort of did the initial training and consulting as they trained myself and some of their co-project managers up to be consultants here at Children's Home Society. And lastly, we are soon to hear from the team at Cultivate Learning out of the University of Washington who handled the evaluation. So a lot of partners were part of this project. Um, Find DEL was offered to early learning providers who received lower ratings or were about to be rated, those serving lower income families, and those serving children who were involved in the child welfare system. So that was how um, we identified the priority list for providers to be coached. Um, and then, of course, some of these, uh, some, some uh, sites have many uh, teachers in them. 
and we had like a who might benefit um, list that was given to like a center director or a center owner that helped them identify who might benefit most from coaching, which laid out um, what FIND was targeted for, like promoting attentive, responsive interactions, reducing caregiver stress, and increasing caregiver sense of competence. Um, and so anyone who had goals in those areas we thought would benefit. Sometimes just one or two teachers might be coached. Sometimes um, almost an entire center would be coached, and sometimes uh, co-teachers in a classroom. And we found, you know, it might be a new teacher to the field, and sometimes it was a, a veteran, um, an experienced teacher. Because um, FIND is so strengths-based, sometimes folks haven't experienced that. So um, even if someone's an experienced teacher, they would often find value in sort of like someone telling what they were doing right um, as opposed to what they were doing wrong. So we found people at all different levels um, have engaged in the FIND coaching. Uh, FIND DEL started in 2015 with a small feasibility pilot in one region with two coaches, and they coached 18 different providers, um, all of whom completed FIND. Um, and so, we, you know, we showed it was feasible, but we did learn a lot about um, technology um, issues that we've, that we've made some improvements in and, you know, continue to work on, and um, some with the materials and the delivery um, length of time for FIND. And the current iteration of Find DEL started um, about two years ago in January 2016 with about uh, almost half the state. And then in July 2016, um, all 10 regions came on and we've been continuing since then. Um, so it's over about two years in. Just a little, just give you a little picture, um, especially for those from out of state of what this model looks like. So. Um, here is a picture of the 10 different regions. Some of them, since we started, have merged. Um, some of the central, central regions are now one region. But basically, the 10 regions have two coaches each, and they coach about um, four providers at a time. They're all ha sort of half-time coaches, and they also usually have other roles as well. And they send videos back and forth with Children's Home Society of Washington, who, where we have a team of about five half-time editors who edit for these 20 coaches. Um, who then send the edited films back and forth for coaching, as well as audio recordings of their coaching sessions. So, um, and you can see there's University of Oregon down there off the map, um, who mostly at this point, um, they helped us get this rolling, but it, now they're just supporting the consultants at the Children's Home Study of Washington. Um, and we are running this pretty much entirely in state. And I know Melanie spoke to uh, scalability, and we found that having sort of a hub model Instead of having to train all the coaches additionally as editors, we are able to have a small four or five editing team supporting these you know, 20 plus coaches. Just to give some quick numbers on the implementation so far, we have reached um, 418 caregivers as of the beginning of this month. Uh, 321 caregivers have completed fine coaching. Um, 53 um, received some fine sessions and then, and then dropped out. And then 44 are currently receiving fined. And I was just going to say, of those 53 who dropped out during fine coaching, we found um, about 80% uh, were due to job changes, usually um, leaving or finding a better job. And some regions have a lot higher turnover, especially if there's more job availability at, at higher pay. I know Roxanne has told us that infant toddler um, teachers are one of the sort of lower paid um, people in the scale, which is unfortunate since their job is so important. And maybe we can address this a little. I thought there was a question relating to workforce retention. Maybe we can address that a little bit uh, later in the session. Um, one last thing I wanted to point out was, um, you know, one of the benefits of having these, you know, skilled coaches is that they come up with really great innovations. Um, and in the pilot, one of our coaches sort of had made a rough um, alignment between uh, find um, elements and uh, what the sort of class areas are. And you know we had heard her using this in her coaching sessions. We thought it was really great. And then we um, created uh, a handout, um, sort of a, a crosswalk, it's called, between the two um, to help show how FIND um, lines up with what class is looking for. And um, you know, I think Victor might talk a little bit more about this tool. But I really wanted to highlight it just as like the real benefits of working with all our coaches and what they've added to this project over the last two years. And with that, I want to turn it over to Victor, who's going to talk about fine coaching. Okay, thank you, Luke. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump in on the slides. You'll see a couple guiding questions to kind of share a day in the life of a fine coach. And so I'll just go ahead and start. Uh, one of the questions is, how have you been successful in recruiting providers? So something that we've done throughout the fine process um, 
to help with that is that we have been able to find program by at the beginning. First, we took into account existing relationships we had as public coaches that were mentioned uh, by Luke and, and Roxanne there with child care providers and reached out to those early learning professionals first. And when that was no longer an option, uh, we then reached out to early achievers uh, coaches to help with a warm handoff. Uh, model. And then the idea was to at least have a provider open the door for having a conversation about brain development and allowing the find coach to come in and present the find model to them. And then as we continue to evolve, eventually we wrapped in uh, more collaborative efforts with early achievers coaches to help identify providers who were higher priority for receiving services and created time uh, with that provider to build a relationship uh, for a few weeks leading up to then participating in the find coaching model. And then what um, types of reactions that we've seen to the fine coaching. Uh, one reaction to fine coaching has included a variety of emotions and mixed feelings of anxiety and excitement by a majority of the providers uh, that I've worked with leading up to the first filming and coaching session. Just the initial idea of having someone come uh, into their home or classroom with the intention of filming them and their work can put any person on edge. Uh, it has been very helpful to validate the provider's feelings and reassure them we're only focusing on the positive aspects of their interaction, highlighting things they're already doing well to, for a child's development and putting those interactions of serve and return into the context of the five elements of find. And then after participating in the first film review during a coaching session, providers have responded with a, a, another variety of emotions and reactions as well. They have varied from a huge feeling of relief to excitement to even very emotionally and heartfelt moments of providers breaking down in tears, expressing how nobody had ever taken the time to share such positive feedback and value for the work that they do every day. Some growth that we've seen with providers. Um, providers have reported empowerment and pride for the work they have been doing for so many years that has often gone undervalued, like uh, Luke was saying that very underpaid types of jobs, but often the hardest jobs if we're talking about a center or even a family child care home working with that younger age population. Overall, early learning professionals have walked away after completing their fine coaching with a sense of value for their profession, newly defined skill sets for in intentional interactions they share with children, and a stronger connection between their everyday actions and the children in their care. And after participating in FIND, providers have also reported they have gained a better understanding of the class tool, which was being referenced in that previous slide uh, with the crosswalk, and their enjoyment of practicing the FIND elements while expanding their skills. They also share a completely different feeling about interactions with a lot of less anxiety. So what challenges? Uh, I think we spoke a little bit about a couple of challenges that have come up, but the biggest barrier is with staff turnover in the child care center. And any provider could have things happen that could cause for a temporary setback, such as facilities going on lockdown, so you can't come in and film or have any kind of coaching session uh, because of what else might be going on around in the neighborhood. Um, teachers could be out sick or even children being out sick when there is supposed to be a filming session. So since the children who have signed parent consent forms are the only ones we can film, I ran into issues of children not being present and needing to reschedule. Another challenge that has come up, providers in Central Washington are very spread out, and some are as far as a three-hour drive away from our home offices. So that's always fun, especially with a variety of seasons. We have all four seasons here in Central Washington. Um, so when the snow falls, we can take a little extra planning. Uh, some providers have also opted out of participating depending on where they are in the early achievers rating process. And I've also heard some other um, providers opt out of or postpone their services when they report they're enrolled in a higher education program. So just conflicting stress. And if we jump into the second set of questions here, um, can you tell? telling you a little bit about what it's like in the family home setting. In the family home setting, one of the main differences is that you're not able to pull a teacher out from the classroom setting because the provider is often the only person providing that service in their home. So they can't rely on a 
another staff person filling in for them while we have a conversation. Um, there are some facilities who do have an assistant, which allows for a little bit more flexibility if you need to do a coaching session with the provider, but definitely still some challenges if we start looking at maintaining ratio, depending on how many children are present that day. And something that's unique also to these challenges are flexibility during those filming uh, sessions also needs to be considered when the provider has to interact with all the children in her care, because she's still working, right? Or he or she is still working. So if she has a mixed age group, which includes children over the age of three, who are not consented for filming as a, as a coach, it becomes more important to be hyper aware of what is going on all around you so you can move the camera accordingly as to not accidentally film a non-consented child. And if we move into a couple successes um, for overcoming some of these challenges, it's been very helpful to set up a schedule where filming week appointments occur in the morning and coaching sessions are scheduled midway through nap time, so about one o'clock in the afternoon, um, depending on where that lies along with the provider schedule. Uh, so it's easier to get the provider's attention and minimizing interruptions uh, when going over those films, the better the films. And in central Washington, we also have a large number of monolingual Spanish-speaking licensed child care homes. And when we started looking at getting the pilot communities off the ground, the fine teams were very responsive and immediately tailoring the fine materials to make them available in Spanish. And some coaches, this is just a byproduct, have gained ninja-like skills in filming now. And I'm going to hand it back to Luke and see if he has anything else to add uh, or open it up for the Let's Talk session. I'll get back to Debbie. Okay, great. Ninja-like uh, filming, I love that. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing all this on-the-ground um, uh, information. Let's go to a couple of our questions. Do you have a minimum requirement for the coaches in terms of education or experience? This is Luke. I can. Um, I might want to ask some other folks on the call to answer this because I think for fine DEL, it would be whatever you know uh, is required for an infant toddler coach in the regions to be hired. So maybe Roxanne or um, Victor could answer that better. Or maybe um, there might be somebody else on the call who could answer that from the regions. I, I, for find, Melanie could maybe speak more to this, but I don't think there is a minimum requirement for fine coaches in general. You know, there are a variety of different um, adaptations of find. We currently have one here um, focused, on, focused on home visiting with Latino fathers. And, um, you know, we've generally hired coaches who have a background in early childhood, but we did just hire someone um, who had more of a, a research background and like um, um, teaching uh, languages. And um, we've trained him up as a coach and he, you know, like, he can't go into some of those like extra things that dads might ask about um, about child development, but delivering find, which is a very sort of manualized uh, program, um, he's been very successful, surprisingly successful, even without having um, a background in early childhood. Mm -hmm. Did anyone want to speak to the um, find DEL specifically minimum for coaches? Hi, this is Roxanne. Um, so our all of our find coaches, all of our infant toddler coaches meet all of the coaching requirements for our, our UW coaching requirements for the QRES. Um, and so they do have um, training in the ERS and the class. They've also received some specific training um, from uh, one of our programs at the University of Washington, the Herring Center, which is specific for children that would have um, behavior challenges um, and special needs in those areas. So uh, that was some basic training that they have. They are reliable in toddler class, and they have had an overview of the ITERS, R, which is what we're using right now. Oh, um, great. This, Thank you. Can, yeah, go Jeff, ahead. can I just add one last thought? Yes. Um, this is Melanie again. And uh, just to add to what Luke was saying about the, the FIND program, generally speaking, um, was designed to be really flexible in terms of who can effectively use the model and coach. Um, so there aren't any minimum requirements around sort of formal training or educational background. We've had wonderful coaches um, that range from, you know, folks that are at sort of more of a peer coach or paraprofessional level up through, um, you know, folks with master's and doctorate degrees in relevant fields. So 
um, it's designed to be a pretty flexible approach in that respect. Thank you. Luke, I think you mentioned that maybe we would get to this question about is your sense that preliminarily um, that use of this model might impact systemic issues such as workforce retention? Does, does anybody have something to say about that question? I could start the conversation in saying that I don't think we have um, we don't have any hard numbers on that. I think we have like mm -hmm. anecdotal evidence on that. Mm -hmm. And um, one region just sent me some some sort of feedback um, forms they use, which we would like to start tracking things like this better. Um, but this is just sort of in the moment, like, did this make it more likely for you, you know, to stay at your job? And people people uh -huh. were saying, you know, yes to that. Again, this is a very small sample um, based on anecdotal evidence. We did find, um, based on uh, some of the, we for part of the evaluation, which um, you know, Cultivate Learning would be talking about that next, but there was a sort of post-evaluation, and um, they heard sort of anecdotally from, from caregivers that they, they stayed at their job because they enjoyed the coaching, um, but sometimes they would be gone by that sort of like three-month post-evaluation. So it definitely seemed, not definitely, you know, it seemed to be um, keeping people around for the coaching. But um, I think long term is still a question to be answered. I think we, we mm -hmm. think it could because of that you know sense of competence and sort of incre decreasing stress and enjoyment. But um, I don't think we have hard numbers on that. Maybe I don't know if Victor has any sort of other anecdotal evidence or he'd like to share. Does anyone have a, an? Add. Okay. Hi, this um, is Roxanne. I will say that it is something that we um, that we are interested in, and we have specifically built that into our evaluation um, ah. to take a look at this because we do in our state. I don't know if this is the case in all states, but we do have a very high turnover rate. Um, in fact, when um, when infant toddler consultation was started before it came into QRAS, there was some question about whether or not we could do an intervention that was going to be 10 sessions long because we weren't sure if we could have teachers stay that long because previously in infant toddler, the coaches were reporting every single time that they went out, like every month they would go out and it was a different teacher. So, um, mm -hmm. so yes, that's something we're very interested in learning a little bit more about. Oh, it, we are treading into evaluation questions, but I'll ask this one and then we'll move to the evaluation. Have um, in Washington State, have you had any experience working with tribal programs using this approach? And if so, are there any differences noted or challenges? Victor, would you Victor, I think I can answer some of that question. Um, I have worked with at least one provider uh, that did not hold a DEL license and was only held a tribal license, but they were also part of the Early Achievers program recently enrolled. And some of the challenges that we came into were just confusion around what can it, what can I do and what can I not do uh, based on some feedback from the tribal licensor. And the way that we resolved that was just by sitting down and clarifying with the tribal licensing team on, on what our project was about. And, and um, I think the bigger questions were, were just around like going into tribal land and whether or not it conflicted. Uh, but at the end of the mm -hmm. day, it was resolved with just a summary of, well, it, it, this falls within the Early Achievers uh, participation pieces. It's kind of a bonus. And uh, we were able to continue with services. And as far as differences, uh, I don't believe I found any differences because I have worked with other family child care home settings, this particular provider within a family child care home setting. But I do look forward to engaging a, another facility that was that is connected to uh, the tribe that is actually a 24 hour facility connected to a uh, casino here in the in the local area so more to uh, come on that okay well let's move into um, the research part of the session today and turn it over to Janet and Natalie Hello, we can't hear you yet. Have you unmuted your phone? Sorry about that. Can you hear 
hear me now? Yes, I can. Thanks. Okay. This is Natalie Ceballos. I am the Training and Quality Assurance Lead at the University of Washington with Cultivate Learning. Um, I have been involved in research projects over the last three years here, and um, I was highly involved in the data collection process as well as the data processing of this fine evaluation. And I will hand it over to Janet Soderberg now. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Janet Soderberg. Um, I'm the Director of Research and Evaluation here at Cultivate Learning. Um, I've been affiliated with the University of Washington and Gail Joseph's work here um, since 2011. Um, we've partnered on numerous projects. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Thank you. Um, so uh, we are going to spend a few minutes here. I know we're um, I'm being mindful of our time, um, but I wanted to spend a few minutes talking a bit about um, the evaluation. So just going to provide some high-level information um, on the evaluation and give a quick status update. Um, Um, and talk a little bit about uh, the purpose of the study, um, the study design, um, um, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the timeline. We won't go into too much detail, but we do have a slide on that for folks to reference. And then we wanted to spend some time on the measures that we use. So um, really look at the tools that we use to gather information for the study and talk a little bit about um, how those relate to the theory of change that Melanie uh, mentioned earlier. Um, so I'm going to um, get started on that, and then I'll hand it over to Natalie at the end to uh, give us a, a status update. Um, so the find, uh, the find Dell evaluation, as Melanie mentioned, is one of many currently being conducted across the country and internationally um, to better understand the FIND program with various populations and in multiple contexts. Um, for our purpose, uh, this evaluation is, um, is uh, the purpose of this evaluation is to explore the effect of fines on interactions between caregivers and children. So really looking at caregiver change across the course of uh, the study. And then secondarily, also look at the effects on children's learning and development, um, specifically in the area of social, emotional, and behavioral skills. And then as Melanie mentioned, we've got a number of moderators that we, that we are really considering um, in this work to, to understand um, who is benefiting from fines as, as a coaching model. So um, in terms of study design, uh, this evaluation is a nested uh, weightless control study design. Um, it gives us the ability to evaluate the effects of find on both caregivers and children. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the design, participating programs um, across the regions of Washington were matched on regional demographic characteristics and randomly assigned to one of two conditions. So they fell either in the coaching or the weightless control condition. Um, and so with that weightless control, um, that group really serves as uh, an untreated comparison group uh, during the study. Um, and this design, I think, was really uh, was, was lovely. We uh, were able to maintain rigor um, while also meeting the needs of Dell as the implementation, implementation of FIND um, rolled out at the state level. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, our data collection time points and unpack these two conditions for folks to get a better sense of um, kind of the study activities. Um, so for the coaching condition, uh, we had three data collection time points. Again, this is the group that received the intervention. So our first site visit is what we called our pre-find data collection time point. Um, and this visit happened either prior to the um, the video coaching program or the intervention taking place, we went in and collected data prior to or within two weeks of that first coaching um, session. And then the intervention lasted, as Melanie spoke, about 10 sessions. And so that was approximately 10 weeks. In some cases, it was a little bit longer. Um, and then at the conclusion of the intervention, we went in and collected the post-find data. Again, I, this is another um, 
visit where we uh, conducted classroom observations and had the caregivers fill out surveys. Um, and that post-vine visit happened within four weeks of the caregiver's final coaching session. And then our last uh, site visit happened um, at three months, and we call this our three-month post-find um, follow-up visit. And that visit occurred approximately uh, in between 12 and 14 weeks um, after the last coaching session. For the control group, and again, this is the, um, this is the group that received intervention after the active treatment group. Um, we first went and collected some baseline data that we call pre-control. And then there was a control period of um, between 10 and 12 weeks, um, at which point we went back in and um, conducted classroom observations and surveys at what we call our post-control pre-find data collection time point. Um, and then again, this mirrors the other condition in terms of the intervention. There was a, uh, the coaching uh, um, occurred for approximately 10 weeks. Um, and then the post-find visit happened four weeks after the final coaching session. And then the three-month follow-up uh, post-find visit occurred 12 to 14 weeks after their last coaching session. Um, and then I have a slide here just that kind of spells out the timeline of our study activities just in a, in a larger sense for folks to reference. Um, I, we really want to, just in the, in the uh, sake of time, we just, I just want to point out the active data collection piece here. Um, so we began collecting data in April of 2016, and um, that active data collection cycle lasted for just over a year. Um, our final data collection, date of data collection was June 29th of 2017. Um, so I really want to talk a little bit about the measures that we used. Um, so um, our data collectors were trained up on a number of measures, um, and I'm going to just talk briefly about uh, some of the ones that uh, relate to the, the theory of change. Um, in general, we had two data sources. So our data was um, collected from caregivers as well as from the parents of participating children. Um, so in terms of outcomes, if you all can um, remember <laughs> um, uh, Melanie's graphic that she had, she had outcomes for both children and caregivers as well as some moderators that, um, that are of interest. In terms of outcomes, um, one of the primary outcomes at the caregiver level is um, that, we, uh, that we look at quality classroom interactions. And so the measures that we used there were um, live observations of the classroom using the class. Um, we used the infant class, toddler class, as well as the combined class in our family child care home. Um, we also observed the classrooms using the serve and return scale, which you heard Melanie um, uh, talk about earlier, so really looked at those five elements of serve and return. Um, we also observed classrooms using the Piccolo. The Piccolo is an um, a observation checklist of interactions um, that uh, typically is used with parents, but we, ha we use that in the group setting. Um, and then one other outcome of interest was uh, the LENA. The LENA is a language environment analysis um, tool that it is basically an audio recorder that the caregivers wore um, during the day. And it yields um, two things for us. One is the uh, just raw word count, so how many words the, the caregiver is using throughout the course of the day, and also conversational turns. In terms of moderators, um, Melanie spoke to the fact that, um, that we uh, looked at kind of trauma. Um, we used the ACEs, which is the Adverse Childhood Experiences Scale. Um, we also uh, have direct measures of caregivers' executive function uh, by using the NIH toolbox. And so there's two, um, two tools there that we use, uh, the flanker as well as the dimensional change card sort. Um, we also have the caregivers self-report on their executive function um, using the, uh, the brief A. And then um, Melanie also spoke a little bit about kind of job stress and caregiver well-being. Uh, we did use the uh, job stress inventory to get a sense of um, caregiver change on that measure um, and also have a um, just a general survey of demographics. I think that one of the uh, participants' questions in terms of like experience and education level um, 
not necessarily for coaching in general, but in terms of the evaluation, we do have um, some demographic information on the caregivers so that we can have a sense of um, who's benefiting the most. So our second data source um, is uh, looking at the, um, the parents and um, of the participating children. So we have the parents uh, report both on themselves as well as their children. Um, and then the caregiver also reported on the children. So um, again, I'm just going to highlight a few of the measures. Um, I can make the, the full list available to folks afterwards. Um, but I do want to just highlight um, that primary outcome for children that we're looking at is really around um, social, emotional, and behavior skills. And so a few of the measures here that were utilized were the ages and stages questionnaire, um, the child behavior checklist, um, and also the, uh, so the parent and caregiver version of that tool. Um, the brief was also used in terms of understanding that the executive function skills of the child. And then the caregiver daily report, which is a tool um, out of the University of Oregon. Um, so there were a number of measures. Um, and again, I can provide the full list. I think, that, I, think I mentioned maybe a third of the, of the measures that we used overall. Um, and then we have a number of time points. So we have um, all of these measures were collected at three time points with the, um, with the coaching group. And then um, they were all collected at four time points with the, uh, with the control group. And so uh, as you can imagine, that yielded an enormous amount of data. Um, and I'm going to hand things over to Natalie to just kind of take us through kind of where we're at in terms of data processing and talk a little bit about next steps. Hi, OK. So as you guys know, we finished our data collection in June and have since been processing the data. All our data has been scored, quality checked, and entered. Um, with the exception of our two executive function tests and the LENA recordings, those are still being processed. Um, and then in addition to that, we've also had 30% of our data quality checked as well. Um, and while we have not analyzed all of the data, Yet we do know we currently have um, data on about 155 caregivers and 400 children, though we do expect some attrition as is typical in research. Um, but our team of data analysis is um, currently ana analyzing some of our data, um, and we hope to have some findings to deliver at the end of January. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Phil Fisher at the University of Oregon. Thank you, um, Natalie. And I want to um, first acknowledge that that presentation is a bit of a cliffhanger. That is, we have a really exciting description of, of um, uh, an evaluation that's just amazing to me um, that the UW team in collaboration with everybody else was able to pull off and we're anxiously, as hopefully other people on the, on the line are, awaiting the results and hope to be able to make them available soon um, in terms of what we learn from this particular evaluation. Um, I'm going to make my comments brief so that there is sufficient time for question and answer, um, because I think that's probably more valuable than um, kind of a detailed wrapping up that I might give. I just want to make a couple of um, points in kind of drawing conclusions for the group that's been presenting. First of all, I really want to express my deep and sincere gratitude, and I, I know I'm speaking for everybody in the Oregon team, um, to all of our partners who um, are reflected in this call. I, um, I, I would just note that the FIND program is the culmination of our team's several decade effort to try to build programs that have potential to be useful and impactful and also scalable. Um, and one thing that I hope people will take away from the discussion is the, the um, idea that FIND is potentially, as we learn about it, um, a useful tool that can be incorporated into QRIS systems to help support um, the quality of interactions in the context of both home-based center child uh, center-based child care. Um, but I really hope that people are not sort of uh, receiving this as we've been doing X, we're going to discontinue X and and then implement find in its place 
um, and throw everything else out. Because in the context of our time in the field, I know what we've seen too frequently is this kind of pendulum swing back and forth from one model to another that just creates more churn um, and challenges for people who are working in both directly with children and trying to support um, the children and their, their families. So hopefully this is something that people will consider in terms of how it might fit into the existing um, approaches that are, that are being developed or have been put in place in the context of the, their QRIS systems and other efforts to support providers in early learning contexts um, to be another piece of the puzzle. In that, um, in that context, I just want to make it as evident as we can that we're really at a point, and, and the work that you've heard about today is sort of a, a, like a way of demonstrating this, that we're, we're excited at this point um, with the, the knowledge that we have potential with this model to implement in a fairly rapid cycle kind of way a uh, large-scale implementation in the context of these state systems um, and to pair it with evaluation that allows us to learn questions about what's working for whom and why. And that's really our goal. We, we do not um, adhere to kind of the idea that uh, program evaluation is about validation and then, um, you know, sort of taking a program and scaling it indefinitely without continuing to evaluate, but rather um, that evaluation has to be um, a component part of the implementation process, and you've heard some about that today. So we're really eagerly looking for partners that are um, kind of at the stage that um, the Dell team and, um, and others in the state of Washington were at a couple of years ago when we just got started to implement a number of additional large-scale um, implementations in the context of these uh, state QRIS systems. And um, hopefully the other thing that you'll take away from what you've heard so far is that the approach is by design intended to be um, both very precise and specific in terms of the, the, what the, the coaching process involves, how we edit films, and what the core content um, that we, that we focus on to support um, the quality of interactions in early learning settings. Um, the form that it takes, though, is by design and in its very DNA designed to be flexible um, so that it's not necessarily the case that what is the way that it worked in Washington would be the expectation about how it would need to work um, in other locations. And in fact, one of the things that makes our entire team's eyes light up um, is when people hearing about the approach say to us, that's a really interesting, um, have you ever tried doing it in the context of, and then fill in the blank, maybe it's in the context of groups, maybe it's via web-based um, coaching, um, maybe it's in um, various Chinese dialects, as mm -hmm. Melanie mentioned, in, in a program we're doing in New York City right now. Um, but that's where we get really excited because we have a sense that we're, we have the potential then to engage in a co-creation process. Um, and one in which we hope will be sort of mutually informative. So that's really where I want to leave things with everybody. Um, questions about whether it works in tribal programs, questions about um, you know, how it might map on to other efforts to do things to increase retention um, and job satisfaction. Um, all of those things are of great interest to us, and we really want to hear from you about what your priorities are and about the extent to which if you think this is a a potential um, option for you in terms of the systems that you work in and could do something along the lines of what you've been hearing about, but with adjustments, um, then we want to talk to you as well. Um, and I think Melanie's um, email was listed as a contact point, um, and I'm sure that, that um, we'd be happy to kind of provide more information and get back to you for any, answer, any questions that we don't get answered um, in the next 10 minutes. So thank you very much. And I'll turn things back over to um, yes. Hi, this is Deb again. Thank you so much for that wrap up, and it's just very exciting. Um, I know that there's a lot of discussion around successful coaching models and methods, and this topic is of great interest. Um, as 
states are developing this quality framework. Um, I'd like to open the floor to um, anyone who feels most positioned to answer just a few questions here. Are there sample videos available for people to view, or is that the private connection between the, the coach and the person? I, how do you handle kind of sharing what, what a session looks like? Do you have any samples? I can feel that. Um, if you're curious to hear more about the core approach um, and serve and return and the five elements, one place you could look is on the website of the Center on the Developing Child. Um, if you go to that website and search for FIND, um, you'll find there's a two-page handout that describes serve and return and the five elements. There's a short video on serve and return. There's also a short video that talks about FIND, mostly in the context of using it to support parents, but I think a lot of that would still be of interest and relevant. Um, and then beyond that, folks are welcome to get in touch with me. Um, my email will be at the end of the slide deck if you'd like to learn more. Um, and we, we don't have any sample videos posted online yet, but we could send you a link to view some if you'd like. Great. Megan, can you unmute yourself and ask this question? Um, does the coach collect the live observation video or is that someone else? So we know that there's the live observation, the film editor, and the coach. Does the coach collect the live observation video? Can you unmute yourself? Debbie, I can take a stab at answering that. I oh, think I great. I, that would be great. Um, this is Melanie, but again, others on the team, feel free to jump in. So if I understand her question co correctly, um, she's wondering um, how we gathered the, the observational data for the evaluation. Um, and the way we did that, that was through trained um, research assistants based at the University of Washington who went out to the site and obtained that, those observations. And that was separate from the videotaping that was part of the coaching process. Um, so I, I think that's the distinction you were looking at. We gathered um, things like the surveys, the live observations were all done by the research team at the University of Washington. And the coach's role was to film the caregiver um, and play back the edited clips to them, and those edited clips were created by the team at Children's Home Society of Washington. So you can see that this was really um, a team effort to make both the implementation and the evaluation happen. And I'm not sure if this is part of the question, Megan, but um, if you're asking whether the coach is also the person who collects the film that they'll be using um, for their coaching sessions, the answer has historically been yes. Um, but also, and that's certainly been the case in the context of the Dell implementation, um, one of the things that we've been um, interested in exploring as a next sort of stage of the development of the program is whether it's possible for caregivers in some contexts, like center-based care, to film themselves, um, or if there's already video being collected for security purposes in the context um, of child care settings, is that of sufficient quality that it could be used um, to edit, which would just cut out some of the effort involved in having somebody go out, as in the context of like what Victor was saying, where it might be a three-hour drive. Um, so that's the kind of thing that's a great example of what I was talking about, about ways that we want to remain flexible um, to, the, to the ways in which FIND evolves um, in the context of childcare. But I'm not sure if I was answering your question or if your question was about evaluation, but I thought it would be a useful extension of it. Yeah, that is useful. I, we have another question. Is the serve and return scale actually an available tool? This is Melanie. I can try to field that. Um, so the serve and return scale is under development. Um, we were looking for a really good tool um, that would allow us to um, sort of quickly and accurately get a sense for the amount of sort of attentive, responsive interaction that was taking place or 
serve and return. Um, and we really couldn't find anything that existed in the field that we thought really captured um, serve and return uh, in the way that we think about it. Um, and so we went ahead and built that scale from scratch. Um, it was used for the first time in the context of this project in Washington State, and we've now tried it out in a couple of other settings, and we're continuing to kind of fine tune it and make improvements and look at things like the reliability and validity of the scale. So more to come. I had a question. How does this effort more focused on infant and toddler in this very specific, um, you know, with the five uh, elements and so forth, how are you seeing it relate to more pre-K oriented coaching practice-based or video models? Do, are you making any connections w within the University of Washington about that or in other ways about how they relate to each other, like in, in tandem, so to speak, in a pro within a program? All right, well, I'll take a stab at that. This is Phil again. Um, and it's a great question. The, one of the things that um, we have observed and heard back from some of our part partners that we work with um, is that as children get older, um, in addition to the sort of responsive um, interaction related to serve and return um, in which the child is either expressing distress um, or exploring the world and learning, that there are also um, priorities around what to do with disruptive behavior, um, with kids engaging in aggressive behavior um, or really um, non-compliant um, interaction. And um, again, what I would speak to there is the complementarity of this approach mm -hmm. with existing other approaches. Um, the, the model really evolved at um, an organization originally in which some of the original kind of uh, behavioral training um, to, to deal with behavior management came into practice. Um, and there is just a vast amount of complementarity in terms of how you think about um, kind of limit setting and um, effective discipline behavior management strategies um, and how they relate also to the serve and return process. One of the things that we're really interested in developing as sort of a next generation um, is uh, what we're, we tentatively call dealing with challenging serves mm -hmm. as opposed to <laughs> require support, um, encouragement, um, and nurturing. And, and certainly that's something um, that makes sense to do in the context of this kind of strength-based model of showing people when they're doing um, correct and supportive things. Uh, but again, mm -hmm. there, the, the idea of complementarity with other programs is really critical here. And the, the mm -hmm. question then is, what is being done that is helpful um, and really does seem to be impactful in dealing with more disruptive kinds of behaviors as kids get older in addition to the support and nurturing? I'd also love to hear from uh, Victor or Luke, um, who've had a lot of experience implementing the program, just any thoughts about this idea of, you know, we typically use find a support um, folks in their interactions with babies and toddlers, but any thoughts about the idea of um, using it to support uh, early learning professionals in preschool settings? Not to put you on the spot, I'm just curious. Hey, this is Victor. I'd like to jump in and build on what Phil was sharing. Um, in terms of using video for behavior management, we have actually, in another program that I worked under uh, when I was a clinician, used a lot of that strength-based approaches with a setting where a child and parent were inside of a session room and the therapist was outside. Granted, there wasn't video being filmed at this, at this particular time, but it was used in the past. So rather than video, it was live feedback uh, through a mic and headset that was being provided for those quote unquote challenging serves and helping the, the care provider, the parent, um, respond or not respond. So I think there's a lot to build on there. And uh, I'll hand it back to Luke, see if he has other things to add. Well, I'd like to, we have, it's time to wrap up the session, but I'd like to ask, well, I do see a very intriguing question in the chat box about 
like implementing parts of this model within an infant toddler coaching system that you have in play. And this may be one to the person that submitted this question where you'd want to reach out to Melanie directly and have a conversation. I know I'm running around in my mind is the notion of um, like teams of teachers doing this together and what they could learn from each other as well as a coach, you know, like within a, a center-based setting. Um, uh, everybody kind of working on it together and, you know, providing feedback and support to each other. You could really, I think, make a lot of a team-building effort around this type of approach. But um, to the person that submitted that question, Melanie, I'm going to tell them to call you about that question about the potentiality of a role for this tool and this system um, yeah. within an already established infant-toddler coaching uh, model. That would be great. Um, mm -hmm. All right, great. Well, I'd like to thank – yeah, go ahead. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to say before we wrap up the call um, that uh, we understand that a few of our um, coaches from the state of Washington uh, joined the web conference and have been listening in, and I just really want to acknowledge those folks who are on the line who have been out actually doing the work. Um, driving the long hours to make it out to remote areas or slogging through city traffic and doing the relationship building and um, really high quality coaching that's made such a difference. So just really wanted to do a quick shout out to any of our coaches that are on the line. Um, we're glad that you were able to join. Well, thank you so much for mentioning that. And again, I'd like to thank you all so much for sharing your interesting uh, research and initiative with us and uh, appreciate you taking the time to prepare such a thoughtful um, discussion and presentation. Obviously, we had a lot of uh, f folks and questions and interest from our uh, participants today. Thank you again. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>